speaker. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, Amin, Namaste. Honorable members, the order for the consideration of the heads of expenditure in Standing Finance Committee was submitted by the Leader of the Opposition on Friday, October 9th, 2015, in accordance with Standing Order 84-2. This should by now have been circulated to all honorable members via email. As provided for in Standing Order 83-1, Five days are allotted for Standing Finance Committee to examine the estimates of expenditure together with the appropriation bill. The proceedings of the committee will formally commence on Thursday, October 15, 2015. However, time permitted, I suggest that the motion to resolve into Standing Finance Committee be moved on Wednesday, October 14, 2015 only to permit Standing Finance Committee to finalize the agenda and hold preliminary discussions on the procedures to be followed. I do hope that members will find this arrangement to be in order. Public Business, Government Business, Bill Second Reading. Honorable members, the debate on the second reading of the following bill which was in progress when the House adjourned on Saturday, October 10th, 2015, will be resumed. A bill entitled, An Act to Provide for the Service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September, 2016. I now, I now call on the Honorable Member for San Fernando West. Much obliged. Madam Speaker, it is a sincere privilege and an honor to be an elected member of the House of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago. I am extremely grateful to God the Almighty for having taken us through the journey that brought us here. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the people of San Fernando West who so resoundingly broke every record in San Fernando West to place me here as their representative for all. Yes, sir. Madam Speaker, I wish to express my profound gratitude to the Honorable Dr. Keith Rowley, the member for Dago Martin West, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, for allowing me to perform the functions <coughs> of the Attorney General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Certainly it isn't lost upon me, Madam Speaker, that this is the first time in quite some time that an Attorney General has been appointed from the House of Representatives and therefore one has a very careful balance to observe in the conduct of discharging the duties for the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at ministerial level, at cabinet level and certainly constituency level, bearing in mind that we must all pay homage to God the Almighty and give respect to our families as well. Madam President, Madam Speaker, it'll take me a little while to transition from my five years in the Senate. Madam Speaker, the bill before us is an appropriation bill. It is set by the formula in Parliament 
we are guided by the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Appropriation bills are meant to be an account of the money spent in Trinidad and Tobago from the financial year prior and then a layout of monies for the financial year ahead. In this exercise, we're intended to speak through you, Madam Speaker, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And in speaking to them, there is an, in, there is an inherent requirement that we give an explanation for that which we have managed and that which we intend to do. Indeed, coming into the saddle of government as we did on the 7th of September, we have inherited a portfolio. <coughs> And may I remind Trinidad and Tobago that we in the government now stand to give an explanation to Trinidad and Tobago of the ministries which we now as a government are obliged to give. I know that this has caused some degree of elevation of temperature in the chamber. No doubt um, there is a heartfelt desire from the members opposite to try and justify the stewardship but we in the government wish to reside in a very simple parameter and that is to try to give an explanation of value for money. This after all is what the taxpayers who put us here, who fund us, expect from us. So Madam Speaker, the appropriation bill says that of the 22 new ministries that occupy Trinidad and Tobago, moving down from 33 ministries, that I am in, re in charge and conduct of Head 23, described as the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs. This ministry, as now presently constructed, is a combination of what was called the Ministry of Legal Affairs and the Ministry of the Attorney General. And there has been some incorporation of the Ministry of Justice. In fact, the allocation prescribed for this purpose is $442,735,550. And that is quite properly, as my friends opposite me notice, a combination of two large ministries, Ministry of Legal Affairs and Ministry of the Attorney General. But for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I think it incumbent to reflect upon the rules and functions ascribed to the Attorney General. It's true that the Constitution does prescribe the basic parameters for the role of the Attorney General, being of course set out in Section 76.2, and that is that the Attorney General shall be responsible for the administration of legal affairs in Trinidad and Tobago and legal proceedings for and against the state. That's a very large, all-encompassing structure. And the areas of responsibility, as I see it, as is quite um, my reflection, involve three substantial areas. The administrative side of the ministry, the legislative side of the ministry, and then the substantive side of the ministry. In the administrative arm, Madam Speaker, I was very interested to zone in upon the figures of the people, the human factor that we are responsible for in this ministry. And the human factor on the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs now comprises 1,867 persons. Of that 1,867 persons, 948 are the Ministry of the Attorney General, 5 coming from the Ministry of Justice, and 669 are the Ministry of Legal Affairs. And I wish to flag now a point which I'll come to a little bit later, the fact that there is a serious disparity existing in the Ministry between permanent positions and contract positions. And there is also a desperate need, Madam Speaker, to deal with of the contract positions, the number of vacancies that are open. There are, after all, in the Ministry of the Attorney General, of the 370 contract positions, 202 vacancies, and of the Ministry of Legal Affairs, of the contract positions 390, there are 198 <coughs> vacancies. And this, Madam Speaker, has to do with the manner in which our system is operating to fill vacancies, something which we intend to do in a very serious measure as a government. Madam Speaker, by way of explaining the tenure past, it was interesting to note that in the five-year period prior 
to this government's um, tenure in the period 2010 to the last financial year ending that the Ministry of the Attorney General, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Legal Affairs, and in particular, I will add, because there's been an absorption of part of this portfolio, the Ministry of Gender, Youth, and Child Development, that these ministries collectively received some $5,472,388,581. That's a lot of money. And what is left for us in Trinidad and Tobago right now is to appreciate how that money was spent in terms of a value for money production on the administrative side, on the legislative side, and on the substantive side. On the, substan on the legislative side, Madam, Pres Madam Speaker, it is well known that the Attorney General pilots a, a vast majority of legislation but is responsible for the supervision of legislation which comes to the Cabinet and the Legislative Review Committee. In dealing with that, therefore, it is incumbent to have as a government an oversight and responsibility for the legislation which comes to you. Much the word legacy used opposite is true to that description. On the substantive side, Madam Speaker, the Office of the Attorney General is responsible for the construction previously of court facilities for the judiciary, the appointments to quasi-judicial bodies, law reform, the legislative agenda, the Office of the Chief State Solicitor, the Office of Solicitor General, the Office of Chief Parliamentary Counsel, Alternative Dispute Resolution, Intellectual Property, Registrar General, the Criminal Justice System, Quicker Justice Initiative Programs, and about 17 statutory bodies. On the substantive side, it is critical insofar as we have a coordinated role with the Office of the DPP to factor the management of the criminal justice system and to make sure that we in Trinidad and Tobago who are desperate to make sure that we live in a safe environment, that our people can feel that our government is genuinely focused upon the deliverables that the people want. After all, Madam Speaker, coming out of an election, surely there is agreement on both sides of the House that corruption is a scourge which must be eliminated from this country. Yes. That crime and the, and the scourge of crime must be eradicated from Trinidad and Tobago. That fairness and equality must be delivered to Trinidad and Tobago. And that when a government spends money, that the government must do so to bring an outcome which is beneficial to the people in the most efficient fashion. So, when one adds the judiciary in terms of the construction and the development program, etc., a total of approximately $13 billion has been spent in these sectoral heads. And Madam President, Madam Speaker, it is now in over the five-year period. It is now important upon us as a country to say what have we purchased for this. Madam Speaker, may I respectfully say that I am speaking through you to the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. May I respectfully say that the PNM's government, that the government of Trinidad and Tobago, as now constituted, is interested in this appropriation in demonstrating efficiency. We are of the view in the month that we have now been into the chair of government, that there is a lot of room to improve the efficiencies of governance by way of improving expenditure efficiency. And the first thing that I want to come across, um, Madam Speaker, is the fact that in this wide array of supervision that the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs must have, the first thing is how much of it goes towards institutional spending in terms of budgetary allocation year on year? How, mu how much of it goes towards developing the structures of government to make sure that the wheels move well? How much of it goes outside in terms of resources to be purchased outside of the ministry and what is the outcome for it? Now, Madam Speaker, some time ago, by way of answer to question posed in the Parliament by the then opposition to the government of Trinidad and Tobago led by um, the member for Separia, we were told in Trinidad and Tobago that the Ministry of the Attorney General spent a total 
of 444,497 dollars. That is close to half of a billion dollars in expenditure in the Ministry of the Attorney General. That's the legal fees only. One half of a billion dollars to external counsel. These are lawyers hired by the Ministry of the Attorney General who do not work full time or on contract for the state and are external lawyers. So the period 2010 to 2015, half of a billion dollars was spent by one ministry alone. I looked at it insofar as the constitutional mandate prescribes in section 76 that the Attorney General is responsible for the legal affairs including state enterprises. The language of section 76 of the Constitution gives you that in section 76 too. And I called Madam, Presid Madam Speaker for a list of state enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago will note that there are 107 reporting state enterprises. Some of them are wholly owned, some partially owned, some where there is a minority interest by the state. And that of these 107, I can now say, having done a review, which is an initial review, but in terms of figures which I have confirmed so far, that of the 107 state enterprises, I have received a report from 60 of them. In examining 60 of these state enterprises, that is where 47 have not yet reported, I am now able to tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago that the sum of money spent by 60 state enterprises, quite apart from the 444 million odd dollars, is 292 million 266,523 dollars uh, dollars and 39 cents. That's on legal fees in 60 out of 107 state enterprises. I am able to say further that of the 22 ministries now const constituted, that four of them have reported as the legal fees. And of the four ministries reporting, that we have a figure of a couple million in addition, but that the Ministry of Public Administration has confirmed 8,545,000 odd, Ministry of Finance, 155 million 382 odd dollars, Ministry of Labor, 1 million 968 thousand odd dollars. Four only of 22 ministries reporting. I did a tabulation, Madam Speaker, of the amount of money that we have now spent to date. And I can tell you that it is a figure very well close to what we warned Trinidad and Tobago we were coming upon. And Madam Speaker, we have arrived at, and there was an error on this because there was an inclusion of pounds sterling stated as dollars and not pounds sterling, Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Taking a 10 million pound figure as 10 million TT dollars, the figure with 47 state enterprises yet to report, 18 ministries yet to report, is 892 802,607,271. Let me put it closer. If you add the 10 million dollars error, we are now at 900 million dollars in legal fees spent over five years. Oh. Oh Conservatively, I don't think I would be doing any injustice to say that one billion dollars nearly was spent in legal fees. When the others report, Madam Speaker, that figure will be produced to the Parliament with details. But I want to tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I'm sorry, I just oh, heard, no. I just heard Madam a Deputy, most... Madam Speaker, I protest. Oh, good. Madam Alan. Speaker. I have heard the comment from this chair. 
and I would like all members to be guided by the standing orders and at least show each other some respect. Ma Madam Speaker, I expect a lot better than that. Let's, let's, let's get it back straight. $900 million in legal fees. And I want to say, Madam Speaker, because I've raised the concept of value for money, it would be incumbent upon me to say, well, look, what have we got for 900 million? Perhaps there's an explanation for it. Perhaps it is a deserved explanation. Certainly, that $900 million spent by the Kamla Pasad Bisesa member for Siparia administration, the legacy left behind for Trinidad and Tobago, has to be factored in the context of what have we purchased? What outcomes have been delivered in the five years under which there was a stewardship? And I want to claw us back to 2010, when the member for Diego Martin West was the leader of the opposition, and he, in the first budget, cautioned as a result of statements <coughs> made by the then Attorney General that Trinidad and Tobago should be cautious not to enter into a witch hunting exercise where there was an inclination and in fact a direct statement that an A team would be hired to prosecute matters on behalf of the state. Because the leader of the opposition wasn't condemning then that you should not spend fees appropriately. He was saying be careful that the exercise of expenditure on external fees doesn't itself become the scandal. That, Madam Speaker, in the second budget turned out to be the expansion of legal fees in the Office of the Attorney General, the one area which doubled. And in fact, it was noted then that that is where the expansion in the budget had come from in terms of growth in legal fees. Today, Madam Speaker, in looking at this exercise, I want to drill down a little bit further. And I want to tell you that of the 900 million dollars, nearly one billion dollars spent in those agencies that have reported so far. I was able to pluck out 11 attorneys who acted for the state. Just 11. And I took some of the matters that they worked on and not all because there are vast volumes of work. I won't in this parliament disclose names of people but I want Trinidad and Tobago to know, firstly, in looking at value for money, what the distribution across the sector was. I want to tell you, Madam Speaker, lawyer number one, 58,167,495.93 dollars. Lawyer number two, 35,818,703.16 million. Lawyer number three, $13,383,000. Lawyer number four, $26,574,235. Lawyer number five, $24,541,670. Lawyer number six, $13,773,402.58. Lawyer number seven, 16,565,083.65. Lawyer number nine, skipping a bit, 50,500,000,0973,040. In adding up 11 lawyers only used by this government, passed, I can tell you. The figure is for 11 human beings, $245,201,908.25. Wow. That's 11 people only. And one of these lawyers was eight months out of law school. Eight months out of law school had earned a figure of $1,363,888.89. One lawyer, eight months out of law school. So that's distribution. That's quantum. Let's look at what we purchased, Madam Speaker. Because after all, one may say, 
perhaps there was a proper expenditure and there was value for money involved in that. I looked at some of the material relative to expenditure. And Madam Speaker, suffice it to say that what the government spoke to the past government and what they did seemed to be far from the case. Let me address an issue frontally that the learned, that one of my learned colleagues mentioned. There was a criticism and cry amongst the UNC members in their post-budget analysis that the Ministry of Gender, Gender Affairs, had been savaged and that there was no reflection on gender and that this was something that had to be looked at carefully and that we had to make sure to give an explanation for it. And I would like to tell Trinidad and Tobago that the reorganization of ministries was a purposeful exercise to deal with efficiency. I want to give you an example of efficiency which relates to how some of these legal fees were spent. So, Madam Speaker, we know that the Ministry of Gender Affairs managed the Children's Authority. And in fact, they had responsibility under successive ministers, Minister Dicoto, Minister Marlene Coudre, Minister Verna St. Rose Graves, um, and Minister Mary King, was it? Because it started in planning. They successively had the responsibility to manage the entity known as the Children's Authority, and particularly to make sure to deal with the proclamation of the suite of legislation concerning children. The Children's Act, the Children's Authority legislation, the Community Residences, if I abbreviate that bill, that package of legislation as was met by the Children's Act 2012 when we did it. We have heard this government passed, the opposition now, tell Trinidad and Tobago repeatedly that you must separate out areas of responsibility because by their submission you had better efficiency. Well I want to tell you Madam Speaker that I hold exactly the contrary view. And I hold the contrary view because what happened to Trinidad and Tobago in a particular instance that I'm about to speak to is scandalous. The cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago in May 2015 by Cabinet Minute 1154 of May 14, 2015, specifically dealt with the proclamation of the Children's Authority Act, the adoption of Children's Act, the Children's Act 2012, its proclamation as well, and the Children's Community Residences, Foster Homes and Nursery Act 2000, its proclamation. The Minister with Responsibility then brought a note to Cabinet dated May 12, 2015 and in it specifically identified those sections of the law which should be proclaimed. I want to remind Trinidad and Tobago that when Minister Clifton Dakota came to deal with the foster care regulations together with two other pieces of regulations that in the debate which ensued in the Senate in particular, I took great care to ask the minister then about the proclamation of the legislation. That debate, Madam Speaker, resulted, that was on the 21st of January 2015. And Minister Dakota had some very unfortunate things to say about my contribution, one of which included the fact that um, I should learn to not be so concerned essentially about all of these matters. And what he said was, in respect of proclamation, that he wants to assure the Senate that the proclamation of several pieces of legislation is an absolute priority for the government. And I do not think only of the government, but of the members here in this August chamber. Proclamation of the act is simply awaiting the completion. So we warned the, gov the government then that proclamation was to be carefully done. It came up again when we were dealing with the family law division of the High Court, which was abandoned by the government um, coming down in the month of May 2015. We again raised the issue of proclamation. Specifically, I raised it as a member of the Senate in the committee stage. To my surprise, the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago, with 
senior counsel then as prime minister with a separate ministry responsible for gender affairs proclaimed parts of the Children's Act and parts of the Children's Homes Foster Care Nurseries Act. Let me tell you what that resulted in, Madam Speaker. That resulted after careful consideration by way of separation of ministries by eminent counsel sitting no less than position as prime minister then in a terrible proclamation such that the YTC, the Youth Training Center, the St. Michael's Home, the St. Jude's Home, that none of them as we stand in Trinidad and Tobago are capable of lawfully housing people detained in those centers. What? It is therefore unconstitutional because the law has been proclaimed to house children, that is offenders under the age of 18 years in the YTC, in St. Michael's, in St. Jude's and very importantly in the women's prisons. What does that mean? Any big deal there? Guess who is prosecuting the case on behalf of child offenders? Who has approached the court to say the government of Trinidad and Tobago is in breach of the law, they have proclaimed the legislation, they have now made it unconstitutional to hold in remand in the YTC boys, to hold in St. Michael's, St. Jude's, to hold in the women's prison. No less a person than my predecessor, the Honorable Anand Ram Logan of Senior Council. That's not the only thing that he's prosecuting. I'll come to a couple of those. So a member, past Attorney General of the now opposition, has gone to court and is seeking to get orders of the court including a declaration that you're held unconstitutionally and damages for unconstitutional detention. Now it is a fact. The law is that they are unconstitutionally held right now. It is known to the members of the opposition. They had a whole ministry of gender affairs to manage that subset. You cried about it when the budget was presented. You said, how could you get rid of the Ministry of Gender Affairs? Lo and behold, the attorney at law acting for the opposition in matters including being senior counsel in election petitions for the government, the same AG, the same AG is in court right now making sure that the state of Trinidad and Tobago yes. pays damages to people who are incarcerated. And let me tell you, as a result of, proclamation. As a result of his government's proclamation. Exactly. So the handbook on awards of damages for false imprisonment and malicious prosecution in Trinidad and Tobago, a handbook produced by the Trinidad and Tobago Judicial Education Institute, just published, says at page 35, and I want to tell the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago what their value for money got. At page 35, Madam Speaker, listen to what we have. There is a table giving you the assessment. If you were to look to detention between 84 days and 186 days, depending upon where we get there, mind you, let me put it clear, detention from May 18th, 2015, when the proclamation happened under the Kamla Pasad Bicesa member for Siparia's um, guidance. That proclamation has resulted in unlawful detention. And we as taxpayers, listen to this one. In the case of Curtis Gabriel versus the Attorney General, general damages 125,000, exemplary damages 50,000. In the case of a Steve Dyer versus the Attorney General, general damages, unlawful arrest, detention $250,000. Let me put this into further context. I'm sorry to borrow some of your space. What does that mean for us? Let me tell you, Madam Speaker, where we are. We have right now a situation where, let me tell you an example of how many people are actually detained. We have, under the supervision of the last government and now, 54 young men detained at 
the YTC, we have a further 16 detentions. And when we get the total amount, we have 72 persons incarcerated at YTC. Needless to say, the number of cases that are now coming forward are growing like a mushroom after a nuclear event. And if you take $250,000 and you multiply it by 72 and you let that amount be a factor which can raise the longer they're in detention, that, honorable members, is the legacy purchased by the Kamla Pasad Bissessa member for Sipari administration. One matter alone, Madam Speaker, it doesn't end there because that's an ongoing saga and I wish to say in respect of solution that that particular mention, the solution to that is that the government of Trinidad and Tobago now has to move as a matter of emergency status to deal with the situation at St. Michael's, at St. Jude's, and at YTC. Just for the record. But, but in terms of honorable member for Oropuch East, I believe you're raising the issue under sub judiciary rule. But one, it is not that there must be ongoing proceedings. It must be that it affects, it has the possibility of affecting the outcome of the case. I therefore rule, rule that he's not in breach of the rule. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the sub thank you for your ruling. I'll move on. Time is short. Madam Speaker, I know that my learned friends opposite may be a little bit uncomfortable about this, but I'm talking about accounting for the money spent by the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm on the point right now of saying how much money, apart from damages, I'm about to say how much money is going to cost to fix it. You see, while that proclamation was happening in May, and while the member for Oropuch was sitting in the cabinet then, reading the note that came to him then, that warned that there was to be a capital outlay. In July, forgive me, in June, when the matter came back to cabinet, it was estimated that nearly 300 odd million dollars would have to be spent to deal with the development and building of two new centers which would take a couple of years to get done. So if they knew that it would take years to get done, if they knew it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, why proclaim the legislation in that fashion? You see, Madam Speaker, to fix it now requires either a legislative invention, an intervention which may involve applying something with retrospectivity which the courts frown upon. We may be met with the uh, allegation that it is ad hominem, that it is geared only to cure a problem with certain litigants. But more particularly, Madam Speaker, we have to find a physical solution to this. So I want to tell Trinidad and Tobago that under the PSIP spending, that we're going to have to deal with this by way of an interim solution, by way of an immediate outpour into facilities, and then we're going to have to take it, Madam Speaker, and hope that we will meet the requirements of the Children's Authority. You see, it is an emergency situation, and the Children's Authority segregated out, as it was, from the supervision of the rare legal arms of the state. We're in a very anomalous situation. Not that I can complain about it, but in Trinidad and Tobago, the Children's Authority has just sued for a similar matter. So we have the state suing the state as they must because the law was proclaimed, Madam Speaker, in circumstances not too far different from a Section 34 explanation or proclamation because there is nothing to make logical or clear how this thing was proclaimed. So that's legacy item one. Madam Speaker, I'd like to tell Trinidad and Tobago that we have had an expenditure, again, to be incurred as a result of the proclamation of the Proceeds of Crime Act. This government came to Parliament, this opposition when in government came to the Parliament. They proclaimed 
the law dealing with the amendments that we made to the Proceeds of Crime Act. We did it in the Finance Bill, Madam Speaker. In that piece of legislation, there was a requirement that you have to have um, regulations and forms prescribed. Needless to say, the legacy purchased by those opposite was that there was no regulation and no prescription to deal with the forms, etc., for detention of monies. And I just like to tell Trinidad and Tobago, there is another matter under the conduct of Anand Ram Logan of Senior Counsel, challenging the constitutionality of the Proceeds of Crime Act as amended looking for a declaration that there has been wrongful seizure and detention because the past government did not do what it was supposed to do legislatively. So the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago have inherited liability and the people that are prosecuting these cases are not only their own lawyers acting for them, you know, culprits. but their past attorney general, one could even say the very culprits architect. are now profiting off of the position. But I want to be fair, I want to be fair, Anand Ram Logan did not leave as the attorney general. We had another attorney general sitting in the saddle then. And so it would not be fair to say that he alone would have known this. But Madam Speaker, when you look at the prison gate litigation, you then wonder how it is we spend $900 million on legal fees and we have attorneys that come to know the system well and lo and behold, they end up in court profiting off the same structures that they came to know. Political enterprise. How does that rank side by side? Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we do know that Honeywell Donaldson did write and dealt with some, did, uh, wrote to the Prime Minister then bypassing her line, Minister the Attorney General, to deal with that. That's on public record. There's another matter. Trinidad and Tobago has inherited a legacy item. I'm sorry, Senator uh, Minister, Mr. Member for Princess Town is not here with us to understand some legacy items. All of us remember the assassination attempt. Allegation that there was an assassination attempt against certain members of the past government. Madam Speaker, I instructed the attorneys at the Ministry of the Attorney General to write to the member for Siparia, the past Attorney General Anand Ram Logan, the past Minister of National Security Brigadier Sandy, and one Mervyn Richardson to tell them that they have an obligation to give evidence which is outstanding in these matters. Because Trinidad and Tobago is now facing a case where we're in court and we can't get the evidence as to the root of what caused people to be detained. The past Prime Minister has not condescended to giving evidence. The past Attorney General, the past Minister of National Security, None of them will, so I instructed the lawyers in the Office of the Attorney General, write them. And if they don't respond, subpoena them in court and treat them as hostile witnesses. And I don't say that other than to say that the ultimate people who will pay the award for damages are taxpayers. Perhaps it is that the member of Sibaria may say she didn't know about it. If so, then we will hear from her. But the fact is, my obligation, the government's obligation, the role and function I must perform is to deal with the taxpaying dollars of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, how did we spend some of our money? The same situation prevails in the anti-gang matters, you know. There are 22 anti-gang matters, people locked up. Again, we have an evidential problem. And I am imploring those opposite who want to speak to their stewardship to please find the time to make sure to give the outstanding evidence that is required to make sure that the taxpayers of this country are not intruded upon more than they need to be. Madam Speaker, how did we spend the monies in Trinidad and Tobago? We do recall that the Honorable Prime Minister then, the member for Siparia, 
called for a commission of inquiry into the Las Alturas project. And I would like to tell Trinidad and Tobago that I instructed and that the permanent secretary in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs wrote to the Commission of Inquiry into Las Alturas. We wrote asking them to indicate whether they needed an extension of time to carry out the work of the Las Alturas Commission of Inquiry because as a government we intend to make sure that commissions of inquiry that have started continue and that we have, as a government, a commitment to ensure that there is transparency in projects. So we have written to ask on the Las Alturas project for that to continue. But I would like to say that the Las Alturas project, which occupied concern because $26 million was at stake, I would just like Trinidad and Tobago to know that the Las Alturas Commission of Inquiry, in pursuit of $26 million, has costed the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago to date eighteen million dollars in legal fees and some operating expenses. Eighteen million dollars, but that's not enough. You see, because the commission has now written for an extension and uplift in the fees. So that is to date the project twenty-six million dollars. We are halfway into the inquiry, the bill is $18 million. But we, Madam Speaker, are people in this government committed to ensuring transparency. I remind that it was Patrick Manning as Prime Minister that called a commission of inquiry into himself. But what was the legacy we inherited from this government? Yes, thank you, Minister of Finance, for reminding me. It is a matter of concern in the Las Alturas project that the contractor who had a design-build contract was not pursued and that there is an issue as to whether the statutory period of limitations has run out. That's the right. same contractor who was awarded the contract to build the campus in the south of Trinidad and Tobago. So you know on a design-build contract that you can pursue people who have the responsibility to design and build and if there's a defect, you collect your money from them. The insurers alone would have dealt with that. But so far, Commission of Inquiry, pursuing $26 million, we have spent $18 million and the bill is going to climb. Not going the Madam Speaker, what did this government's past, what did the past government's legacy leave us with respect to how they pursued matters? I want to touch on something called life sport. <laughs> life sport, Madam Speaker, was brought to the national attention by way of then Minister Gary Griffith's insistence that the program was feeding criminality. The only people that didn't listen to that insistence was the government in the saddle then, now opposition. It took member for Dago Martin Northeast to bring a motion to the parliament which was brought in June 2014, recanting and dealing with matters in the public domain since April and May. It took the Minister of Finance in his position then as Dago Martin East in opposition to bring a motion. That motion was met with contributions from the Minister of Sport then, Anil Roberts. And I want to remind Trinidad and Tobago... Honorable Member for San Fernando West, your 45 minutes have expired. Would you like to avail yourself of the additional 10 minutes? And yes, I would just Speaker. like to caution within that 10 minutes you expect it to wind up. Much obliged. Madam Speaker, there is so much to account to Trinidad and Tobago for. I would happily take advantage of this. Let me just give the summary points in the 10 minutes. The Life Sport Program produced a report the statement in Parliament then was long live life sport, round of death stumping. Leading the charge, I believe, was Oropuch East, who spoke in the debate as well. Long live life sport. Madam Speaker, when I came to the Ministry of the Attorney General, I want to tell Trinidad and Tobago that I met 100 large garbage bags of shredded paper. It occupied a space from ceiling to floor, about the length of this entire parliament chamber. Shredded paper. Shredded paper. Ooh, no. Government property. Ooh, no. To this day, 
I cannot yet get an explanation why the shredders on every single floor of the, of the Ministry of the Attorney General were at work over the weekend. Oh. Nobody knows who shredded it. Wow. But when I came across matters in the description of legal fees, I noted that there was a report on life sport done, a legal opinion done. No file could be found, no file in the Ministry of Sport checked by my learned colleague. So I called the lawyer who did the report, the opinion, directly and found it because the item was there on fees paid. To my shock, a legal opinion given to the Honorable Attorney General 26 of November 2014, which says, in conclusion, Further investigation, a forensic investigation, is required in order to compile the evidence necessary to determine whether sufficient material exists to discharge the legal and evidential burdens in order to maintain civil actions against public officers, persons employed by the state or third parties, which have a reasonable prospect of success, and, as, and a real as opposed to fanciful chance of recovering monies paid out under the life support program. This legal opinion goes through chapter and verse of the compelling and obvious need to look after the recovery of $500 million nearly of expenditure. The report produced by the Ministry of Finance alone is a report which reads as if there was no tomorrow. Everything possible that could be breached by way of procurement was breached. And the public servant named in that report, instead of being investigated by recommendation of a legal opinion to the Attorney General, which went to the office of the Prime Minister, the member for Siparia, that public person was simply put into the office of the Prime Minister. And I have checked with the Ministry of Finance. No forensic audit has been called into this matter. Half a billion dollars in obvious expenditure, and I'm hearing across the floor, well, the police have it. Madam Speaker, I would like to say as the new Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago that I certainly intend on being very measured in my approach in the discharge of my responsibilities for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but that we intend to think outside of the box. I would like to indicate that we intend to make immediate revision of a number of matters that are occupying the state's attention. We will do so objectively. We will do so by benefit of open and transparent advice. We are very mindful that cases such as UTT occupy Trinidad and Tobago's um, attention and fell apart. We are committed to ensuring that there is institutional strengthening in the office of the Attorney General because, Madam, Speak Madam Speaker, a billion dollars spent could be spent on training the staff and attorneys that work for the state. A billion dollars spent could make sure that we took care of the disparity in salaries that are across the system. A billion dollars spent could mean that we could take care of the inequities between contract and permanent positions in the state. A billion dollars spent, Madam Speaker, could be done by way of civil investigation and beefing up what is so much in need of attention, the DPP's department. I want to make an open pledge to the office of the DPP that the legacy that the PNM intends to leave behind as a government is to have strengthened the institutional structures of the criminal justice system as we intend to do. That is why we have in this budget given the judiciary the undertaking that they will have financial autonomy for the first time in Trinidad and Tobago. That is why we have attempted to identify the projects which we will put with lay magistrates. That is why we intend to make sure that the administration of justice is dealt with. And Madam Speaker, I wish to say, in relation to murders, I have established a tracking committee and of the matters that are now in the assizes for trial, Trinidad and Tobago can expect that there will be an explanation as to why people have not faced the hangman. There will be an explanation when they do face the hangman, because if you have the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, they must be applied, and we intend to apply them with due process. But that due process can only happen by way of institutional strengthening. Madam Speaker, there is a mountain of material that we could have dealt with today. And I'm sure that the days ahead will allow us for that. May I say a 
a few things in relation to San Fernando West. San Fernando West is the area of Trinidad and Tobago that time stood still in. We have suffered from institutional rot, from a lack of attention and a lack of dedication. All that San Fernando purchased for its development by way of administrative complexes, etc., all of it has been reduced to naught. That is why I'm very proud for the Minister of Planning's assistance in ensuring that the San Fernando Waterfront Project has been catered for in this fiscal year and that it will mark the transformation of the city that time forgot. We intend in San Fernando West, without fear or favor, without any form of discrimination, to deliver for all of our people. Our river embankments have been eroded. There are no community centers. The vagrancy population has grown. The traffic is gridlocked and unbearable. And Madam Speaker, as the representative for San Fernando West, I intend to leave an institutionally strengthened environment where the pride of San Fernando can resonate once again. Madam Speaker, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, on the issue of fees, the Attorney General's office has implemented as a matter of immediacy that state attorneys are the first attorneys to act in all matters. Senior counsel will be required only in cases where they are required with juniors coming from the state by way of first order. All of the expenses are being reviewed and all of these attorneys who have managed to send in requisitions which are outstanding, I look forward to their participation in finding a solution because the method which we will apply is one of a quantum merit basis. That means attorney's fees will be paid on an objectively assessed standard where you can vouch for your hours of work by virtue to the scale of fees prescribed by the Honorable Chief Justice as has been set out in the rules. It is incomprehensible if Oropo Chiefs will allow me to speak in quiet. It is incomprehensible that one attorney in Trinidad and Tobago could have earned $60 million. Wow. What? It is incomprehensible. Unfair. Do you know what $60 million could do in the Ministry of the Attorney General? Wow. Do you understand, Madam Speaker, what $60 million can do? When we look at $900 million, I can give the assurance as the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago that objectivity and value for money are going to be the <coughs> hallmarks. Because you don't need those things to have fair procurement. And you don't need a proclaimed piece of legislation, which we will proclaim and operationalize, and that is, of course, the procurement re um, legislation. You don't need that to have acted responsibly. Clearly, some of the examples that we have brought today evidence that. And the Ministry of the Attorney General is intent upon acting with an <coughs> identifiable, objective standard for the pursuit of goods and services so that we can give it. Madam Speaker, there are two people who joined several others who have been investigated by the last government. One of them was Professor Ken Julian, who has been exonerated without question by the courts of Trinidad and Tobago in what has turned out to be a trumped up case brought not by the board of the UTT, but instead by the Ministry of the Attorney General in inexplicable circumstances. The same thing happened in the Bamboo Network's ETEC matter. And in those matters, Madam Speaker, I wish to tell Trinidad and Tobago that we are applying an objective arm's length investigation as I wind up. Honorable Member, your 10 minutes have expired. You have three seconds to end. Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute. There will be an objective assessment laid bare for Trinidad and Tobago, and I wish to compliment you on your attention. I call upon the Honorable Member for Faisal Bad. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to this budget debate for the fiscal year 2015 to 2016. First of all, I would like to thank the citizens of Faisabad for the endorsement as a member of parliament and to give the assurance to all 25,000 people who live in the constituency that I will represent them to the best of my ability. 
May I also take this opportunity to con congratulate all the other elected members of this House, especially those who, like myself, are here for the first time. I would also want to congratulate all those members who have already made their maiden yes, speeches. Yes. Madam Speaker, I also wish to congratulate you on your election as the head of this August Chamber and to wish you the very best as you seek to oversee the business of this House and maintain its, its decorum. Madam Speaker, I believe that the role of all governments is to facilitate the development of a country and its people. A government is expected to provide goods and services, to develop policies and programs, and to create the environment in which its people feel creative, committed, and most of all safe. Good governance means that adequate and appropriate infrastructure is provided for citizens, but more importantly, Good government ensures that citizens are provided with the benefits and opportunities that allow them to make a better life for themselves and their families. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I wish to draw reference to, my, to, to this House of the contrasting views of two 16th century English political theorists regarding the role of government. Madam Speaker, members, members, please. Madam Speaker, I refer to Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Both men lived around a time when through different struggles, the people of England replaced the monarchy and installed parliament as the supreme law of the land. Thomas Hobbes considered self-interest to be the predominant motive in man and proposed that centralized power should be given to the state and to an absolute ruler by the people to ensure good governance. On the other hand, John Locke recognized that man possess, possess natural rights such as life, liberty, and property, and proposed that government really was a trust whereby the people would enter into a contract with the state for the provisions of goods and services, but with the understanding that the state would guarantee their rights according to the principles of natural law. Madam Speaker, as we embark on this budget debate, I ask us to consider care carefully whether this budget is a contract with the people or whether this budget would be a reflection of an elected monarch deciding who gets what without respect for the needs. The question then, Madam Speaker, is whether the budget presented last Monday in this August House has the measures required to provide our citizens with the opportunities for continued development and prosperity. I am certain that the Honorable Minister of Finance, in his wisdom, would have presented a budget that his government believes would provide opportunity and promote development in an equitable manner for all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. However, Madam Speaker, my analysis of the budget documents together with consultations with the constituents of Faizabad, have raised various concerns, which I hope the Honorable Minister will take into consideration going forward. Madam Speaker, before I raise those matters, I wish to say that I expect and anticipate that all measures proposed by the Honorable Minister will have as their underlying thread the principles of value for money, efficiency, and effectiveness and in fact, those are the values and principles just enunciated by the Honorable Member for San Fernando West. Honorable, may I please remind Honorable Members of the provision of Standing Orders 53-1-F. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, after listening to the contribution of the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and the Member for Separia in this debate, I am of the opinion that Trinidad and Tobago is not in the precarious position that some of us may want that some of us may want us to believe. Madam Speaker, I am also of the opinion that the sound macroeconomic fundamentals inherited by Trinidad and Tobago does, does not suggest a picture of gloom and doom. The figures show a Heritage and Civilization Fund of over 5 billion US dollars. 
of foreign exchange reserves adequate to cover 12 months of import, inflation of less than 6%, unemployment below 5%. Be that as it may, the global economic picture suggests that courageous, effective, and efficient government will be required to ensure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago do not experience the undue hardships that many other nations are currently experiencing. However, Madam Speaker, as a new voice in this parliament, I am prepared to give the government the benefit of the doubt that their plans as, out as outlined in this budget will continue to give citizens the hope and prosperity that they experienced prior to September 17, 2015. Madam Speaker, that aside, I wish to bring to the attention of this honorable house some achievements in the areas of health and a few questions on public administration. Um, Madam Speaker, I now I speak to the issue of health, and I had the privilege of studying the, um, uh, the looking at the plans of health from the other <coughs> side, from the government, um, and I want to say that the government is a beneficiary of tremendous momentum with several landmark accomplishments and new initiatives um, which can be built upon to provide help for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, with regards to uh, increased patient, to providing patient care and customer service, um, a lot has been done, and especially I'm speaking here now, to achievements in the Southwest Regional Health Authority over the past five years. And one of the major achievements I would want to speak about is the alleviation of what we had as the bed shortage problem. Madam Speaker, you remember um, years ago, well, maybe four or five years ago, there would have been a chronic shortage of bed space um, at the San Fernando Hospital. I am happy to report that now with the San Fernando Teaching Hospital and the increased number of beds, that is no longer an issue. And I'm sure that the member for San Fernando West would be pleased, he mentioned that there were no achievements in San Fernando, but I'm sure he would be pleased that there is now the San Fernando Teaching Hospital, which is providing first class care to the citizens of, of San Fernando and throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I also want to draw attention as well to the, and, and to also mention that to maintain the standard of care with regards to beds and providing proper care that we also anticipate and expect that with the addition of the Children's Hospital in Coover, the beds there, and also with the, the building of the Point Fourteen Hospital, that again, those would add and contribute to improvement in healthcare. Madam Speaker, I also want to mention another initiative um, that, that uh, addressed an issue which I met um, at San Fernando as chairman of the Southwest Regional Health Authority, and that would have been the issue of the long waiting times in the accident and emergency department. I'm happy to say that that is now no longer an issue that has been addressed. Um, and that has been addressed with physical improvements to the accident and emergency. There is now a new structure, a new addition to the accident and emergency. But more importantly, and more than that, Madam Speaker, has been the issue of addressing the customer service within the accident and emergency department. With the addition of a manager um, to actually look at how customers are treated, how patients are treated in the accident and emergency. Now there is a fast turnover. But more than that, Madam Speaker, and I'm sure that the Honorable Minister of Health would be interested and perhaps would be advised, not advised, but would be inclined to continue this initiative, is the fact that we now have a situation where a patient who is waiting for more than one hour or who feels aggrieved in any way, or who feels that he, is not, or he or she is not being treated fairly, can actually call directly the, a senior person within the hospital and get a response. And this is not a clerical person, this is a senior doctor who can address the situation. And this has been working very well for us at San Fernando, or had been, has been working for, San, for the patients of San Fernando. Um, the other issue um, I would want to address, Madam Speaker, um, would also be in terms of the, the value of the on the job trainees. I know a lot has been said about the OJTs in this debate, but um, at San Fernando, we've had the OJTs trained especially in, cost in health customer care, health service customer care, and that has made a remarkable improvement. Now you come to the outpatient clinics, um, you're greeted by someone, 
The benefit of that is that it doesn't take away from the nurses and the doctors who are trained to provide professional care. And therefore, we now have these trainees, these OGTs, who are doing a wonderful job. Um, I was also pleased to see that um, part of the government's policy would be to place increased emphasis on primary care, and that is a commendable initiative. And also to advise um, that that job is perhaps going to be easier within the Southwest Regional Health Authority. Um, because we have already started, and in terms of providing leadership for primary care, within the Southwest RHA, uh, Director of Primary Care was appointed, who has the qualifications of training in public health. Um, we've also uh, started the process of extended hours um, at 11 health centers in the Southwest RHA. This means that patients are now able to go to a health center up to 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in some instances, and they can also access health care on weekends, including a Saturday and Sunday. And this was started for the first time under the previous administration. So it's, a, it's an initiative which has been taken up by patients and which has contributed greatly to improving um, the patient convenience, but also has contributed to decreasing the waiting time at the emergency department, especially at the San Fernando Hospital and the Coover District Health Facility. Um, in terms of providing the facilities um, in, for primary health care, uh, we have recently, uh, sorry, the, a, a, a recently expanded and refurbished health center was opened in Point 14 about two months ago. So I'm sure the member for Point 14 would be happy to hear this. It's a brand new facility which is in use, member. Um, we also have uh, launched, uh, opened recently about a month ago, a, a, a brand new health center in Palisico, and my neighbor, the member of parliament for Labre, would be happy to, to hear that this facility is up and running, um, and it has replaced the old facility which had been there for many years. Um, also, in terms of the looking at the area of Cedrus, um, which is regarded as a, as a distant area for pro providing health care, um, there is a refurbished health center in Cedrus, again with extended open hours, and to cater for the long distance that sometimes patients would have to travel to come to the facility at point 14, there is now an emergency medical team with a 24 ambulance service on standby. So again, I'm trusting that that service can be continued for the benefit of the constituents and the residents of Cedrus and surrounding areas. Um, there is one more issue I'd want to address at the San Fernando General Hospital, Madam Speaker, um, when I assumed the position of chairman there in 2010. Uh, we had a situation where there, was, there were no neurosurgeons for several years prior to that. I am happy to report that within the first two years we were able to uh, get a team of neurosurgeons who are now uh, performing and there's also the training component um, of being able to allow our local doctors to be trained in neurosurgery. Um, so that is, that is an, uh, an initiative that was, um, uh, came about because of the visit from the President of China and arranged um, by the former Minister of Health and the member for Barataria, Sam, Barataria Samo. And at this point, I would really want to take the opportunity to to um, thank the member for Barataria Sanma for his contribution to the health sector in the last four, five years. Um, so before I move on, I would also want to commend all the staff at the Southwest Regional Health Authority um, who have you know, embarked and, and, and worked to, for the last five years um, to ensure um, that all these improvements took place and also to invite the minister to provide the necessary leadership, and I'm sure he will, um, and the direction for them to continue to achieve and to bring back the care into health care. One of the underlying themes at the Southwest Regional Health Authority was that we, we aimed to bring back the care into health care because there was a situation, and perhaps there is still a situation, in many of our health facilities where the main complaint is that you go to a health facility, but yet you don't get that caring feeling. And that is what we were trying to achieve in terms of improving the customer service. Um, so through you, Madam Speaker, I invite the Minister to say, let's do this together. Um, there are many things that can be built on in terms of um, the momentum for healthcare. 
Um, moving on from the Southwest, um, moving on from the Southwest Regional Health Authority, there are just a couple of issues in health that I want to address, which could be of benefit at a national level, Madam Speaker. Um, and one of these, and again, I'm glad to hear and to see that the underlying theme in this budget is value for healthcare. And I just want to touch briefly on value in terms of healthcare delivery, because that is important. It's important to recognize that no matter um, how much resources are provided, uh, sometimes it is thought that um, expenditure in healthcare is a bottomless pit because the need and the wants always increase. So obviously it's important to, um, to determine and to decide what is important and also to provide healthcare in an efficient but also effective manner. Um, one of the issues that is, that is still a problem in Trinidad and Tobago is to actually cost the services in the public sector. In other words, it's difficult to tell, although in the private sector, uh, costing is done. In the public sector, it's difficult, for example, to know the exact cost of an operation. Um, for example, a hysterectomy. I'm pleased to report that a, a survey has been undertaken, um, again at the San Fernando Hospital, by the Health Economics Unit at the University of the West Indies. And hopefully these results will be available um, to, to inform decision making with regards to um, healthcare. Um, the other issue would have been the issue of procurement of goods and services in the RHAs, and I'm pleased to report that um, under the last administration and with the um, intervention by the previous minister, that uh, legislation was passed in this honorable house that now allows one um, RHA to procure goods on the behalf of the, uh, of the other RHAs. The benefits, of course, of, of this measure, of course, would be efficiency, speed, and the savings by both um, by, um, by, bulk, by bulk purchasing. Um, the other issue I want to raise, and again, I feel strongly about this, is, and the question has to be asked, Madam Speaker, and I know that this would have come up for debate in the 10th Parliament um, when a bill was brought by previous independent Senator Victor Wheeler in terms of reviewing the RHEs. But I think the question has to be asked, um, at least in terms of whether um, having four RHEs in Trinidad, and I'm talking about Trinidad, not Trinidad and Tobago, but whether having four RHEs is in fact a cost-effective cost and efficient arrangement. I'm just saying that this is perhaps something to be looked at. And the reason I say that is because at Southwest RHA, because of the arrangements with one part particular RHA, even though the patients from the eastern part of the country would have belonged to the eastern RHA, from a practical point of view, many of those patients were cared and treated for um, by the Southwest RHA. And Again, I suspect the same would have happened in the northeastern area where patients would have gone to North Central. So I just think it's something that perhaps needs to be looked at and, and something that can be raised and discussed. And again, I would encourage the Minister of Health to perhaps look at it from this point of view um, in terms of cost savings and efficiency, whether it should be rationalized. Um, I just move on again, and just one more point I would want to make as far as the health sector is concerned. And that is to address the issue of maternal and child health. And again, I'm very pleased looking at the manifesto for the, uh, for the PNM, which is now official government policy. And I see that maternal and child health um, has been highlighted um, as one of the areas um, to be addressed. And I'm very pleased that this is an area to be addressed because, Madam Speaker, um, the death of a mother is a very, of a pregnant mother is a very tragic event. And, um, as the new minister would have uh, recently encountered very early in his tenure, uh, there was that issue of uh, the tragedy of a maternal death. Um, it's, it's a very, very difficult issue. I myself, as an obstetrician gynecologist, um, <coughs> feel strongly it's a sad event. Um, but also, there, there are many things that have been done over the last um, four or five years um, in terms of strengthening how we can deal with this issue. And I am happy to see that the Minister of Health, through you, Madam Speaker, that the Minister of Health um, would have given the commitment to appoint uh, a director of maternal and, and child health um, for the country. 
Um, this was again an initiative that came through the was on the cards and came through the previous minister and I want to again um, commend the previous minister for bringing that initiative but also but also to say madam speaker that this position came came about through the work of a committee of 12 dedicated citizens of this country and that work took about maybe a two to three year period to analyze and to look at the whole issues surrounding um, uh, maternal and child health in Trinidad and Tobago. And I would want to commend, uh, without calling names, the members of those committee who worked tirelessly and without any financial reward to produce a comprehensive, re comprehensive report. And I would want to invite um, the minister perhaps to have a look at that report. There is no point really in reinventing the wheel um, through you, Madam Speaker. Um, so again, and following that report, in the, I would want to say that the members of this committee would have represented, would have included representation from both Trinidad and Tobago, and would have involved uh, a variety of, of professionals, nurses, doctors, healthcare administrators, and a variety of organizations, regional health authorities, uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association, the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Midwives, the University of the West Indies, um, the Ministry of Health and other, other bodies. So it was a wide consultative process and it's a document that can, um, that can be an excellent platform for building and addressing the issue of um, maternal and child health, especially with regards to maternal deaths. Um, in addition to that, I'm also pleased to say that many of those policies and protocols are already in place in some of the nation's hospitals um, and again, this would have come under the guidance um, and direction of the Chief Medical Officer. So again, without belaboring the point, Madam Speaker, um, as I say, I feel strongly about it. And again, I'm pleased to hear that the Honorable Minister is, and the government is going to place that as, as an area of focus. Um, so Madam Speaker, there is no question in my mind that elections are milestones in the evolution of a nation and neither this government nor this budget will create something out of nothing. Rather, there has been an inherited momentum which I hope will not be squandered. Um, similarly, in public administration, there are a few questions and concerns which I will just raise, and I'm sure that the Minister of Finance and the Women's Minister of Finance will have some answers. But these will include, Madam Speaker, um, the decreased allocation for the e-government and knowledge brokering program, um, the fact that there is no allocation on the public administration for the establishment of a virtual call center in the public service. Um, and I would invite the Minister of, of Finance or perhaps the Minister of Public Administration um, to clarify these in his contribution. Um, Madam Speaker, under the former administration, the Ministry of Public Administration was charged with the responsibility of transforming the public sector into a 21st century organization that would provide the best um, and most accessible services at the lowest possible cost and the least convenience to the people of this country. Um, in other words, it was to make it a more efficient and effective service. Um, the issue of public service in this country has always been an issue and there have always been complaints of when you go to a government organization, sometimes, um, and, and in fact, in many instances, we are not pleased with the service we receive. And just to say that the, under the previous administration, efforts have been made to try to improve customer service um, in terms of several initiatives. Um, there is the, the goal, the Diamond Initiative and the Diamond Certification Program. Um, there have also been issues with human resource structure in the public service um, in terms of the issue of contract contract positions, um, the filling of permanent positions, and the whole issue of, of, re of revision of job descriptions within the public sector. Um, under the last min uh, Minister of Public Administration, the whole issue of human resource structuring was examined and updated um, to correct what was thought at that time to be a pyramidal structure where the public service in 1962, as envisaged, would have had more of a bottom-heavy structure. But as time progressed and the role of the public service changed, um, it was felt that there was a need for more middle management 
in the public um, service to accommodate professionals. Um, in fact, I was surprised to learn that, um, that there were many job dis there were many um, positions that we now take for granted in, in well-functioning, efficient organizations that did not exist in the public service. And I'm speaking to opportunities, for example, in ICT, in project and procurement management, in communications, uh, in facilities management, management, and other areas were previously absent. And I'm, now some of these positions have been addressed and before the chief personal officer awaiting classification. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, just a quick word on the Diamond Certification Program, which had started under this previous administration. And to state that this program, which was launched in June 2013, really aims to provide certification for those agencies that meet certain service standards. And to say, Madam Speaker, that the standards in this program uh, align to the International Competitive Index uh, the Global Competitive Index and the Ease of Doing Business Index. And to say that um, several agencies uh, from various ministries are participating in this program, and many of them have already achieved the standard required for the Diamond Certification. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, I just want to raise an issue which was mentioned, in, which is part of the, the budget document, and that is the issue of the graduate employment program. Um, Madam Speaker, the draft estimates for the recurrent expenditures for, the tw for 2016 indicates an increase of $6,900,000 for contract employment over the revised 2015 estimate. So it's an approximately $7 million increase in the draft estimates. Um, and there is a note to this um, estimate which speaks to the, it says, includes provision for graduate employment. So, Madam Speaker, I would just want to ask that perhaps the Honorable Minister of Finance could indicate whether this increase reflects the cost of the proposed graduate recruitment program for the Ministry of Public Administration. And furthermore, would the Honorable Minister be so kind as to explain the criteria for engaging these graduates? Um, I would also um, want the Minister to um, perhaps explain to this Honourable House uh, what happens to these graduates after the one-year period comes to an end. Um, so those are questions that I would want um, addressed, if possible, to you, um, Madam Speaker. Um, before I leave the area of public administration, and I just want to go on to some concerns that my constituents would have raised, but I just want to touch a bit on the scholarships division um, in regards to public administration. And to state, Madam Speaker, that the last administration had increased the number of scholarships available to our citizens and awarded over 2,000 scholarships over the three-year period ending in September 2014. Um, and also to say, Madam Speaker, in anticipation of the future health care needs of our citizens, the last government also expanded the areas in which these scholarships were awarded uh, to include areas such as the allied health care professions, forensic science, pathology, cardiology, neurology, and oncology. So again, those would be um, professionals, local citizens who would be trained in these areas and come back to serve in a modernized and, and, and um, 21st century health, health sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, more importantly, Madam Speaker, um, the entire process of scholarship, the awarding of scholarships, is now open, transparent, and merit-based. Um, and to say that every one of these scholarships has an evaluation framework, which is published on the website, with objective eligibility criteria, and this accountability and reporting mechanism is a scholarships and advanced training system, which is known as SATIS. And I would, want, I would wish to inquire through you, Madam Speaker, whether this government intends to continue this open and transparent process implemented with regards to scholarship, the award of scholarship by the last administration. And now, Madam Speaker, I wish to bring to this House and to the attention of, and of the Honourable Minister of Finance some of the concerns raised by the constituents of Faisabad when they met with me a few days ago. And if I may, Madam Speaker, um, with your permission, um, 
just to address um, what the residents have said and and perhaps just to say verbatim because this is coming from my constituents and one of the concerns was that the reduction of the gas subsidy by 15 percent would require greater monetary output from gas station owners and operators while the profit margin would remain the same uh, this increase and again i'm quoting from a concerned constituent whom i met with because I believe that the role of a member of parliament should be to meet with, with his or her constituents and of course bring their views to the parliament, which is what I'm doing in my speaker. And this constituent went on to say that this increase in financial output coupled with the increased business levy fund and the NIS contribution would mean a decrease in profits and as such may lead to staff reduction and, and unemployment. Um, the concern of another resident was that the statement made of tax exemption for agricultural products has been in place previous to the budget and as such has been represented by the Minister of Finance. And through you, Madam Speaker, I'd want to give the Minister of Finance an opportunity to correct that if in fact it, it is a misrepresentation. Um, the other concern raised was that, uh, the other suggestion was that there should be a greater focus on the agricultural sector Incentives such as grants for constructing ponds, for example, should be implemented. And the money saved for, from the reduction of the fuel subsidy uh, can be used for this. Honourable Member. The Hansard reporters are having a little difficulty, so maybe you can speak into the, the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sure that. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sure with practice, I'll, I will cease to give the hands of reporters trouble in the very near future. Um, so, again, from another constituent, that the, the suggestion was that there should be greater focus on the agricultural sector. Incentives such as grants for constructing ponds should be implemented. And the constituent thought that the money saved from the reduction of the fuel subsidy uh, can be used for this measure. Um, another constituent was concerned that uh, even with 20% of contracts being given uh, to small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, he, was, he was concerned that can they really expect these organizations to have the capacity and the resources to, uh, to, uh, to access certifications such as a safety to work certification which costs an average of $500,000 and was concerned about the, the, the tedious tendering and documentation procedures for accessing these facilities. Um, questions were also raised regarding clarification on the evaluation methods and rates which would be in effect concerning the uh, proposed property tax. And again, perhaps through you, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance will address these. Um, uh, the other issue that was raised was that um, whether the, the health card would be continued. Um, residents wanted some clarification on that. And again, through you, Madam Speaker, I seek clarification on that on behalf of my, of my constituents. Um, the other issue that came about, and again, my constituents should have expressed concern about this, Madam Speaker, is the issue of the continuation um, of the DB to Mondesi part of the highway to Point 14. Um, Madam Speaker, that um, continuation runs directly through the constituency of Faisabad and is of concern to many of the constituents in Faisabad. And again, with your permission, Madam Speaker, if I can um, read what the concerns were. Um, and the residents were, were pointing out that there are several benefits to the continuation of this part of the highway. Um, there would be quick access to all villages, all villages al along the route. Um, they pointed out the relief of traffic congestion in the point four into San Fernando route. Um, they pointed out the benefit of the relief of traffic in the uh, SS Erin Road. Um, they also mentioned that the um, the, Daisy, the Daisy to Mondesi Highway portion and completion will service all commuters to access uh, the UE South Campus. Um, with much easier, less stress, uh, again, fast access. 
Um, we also pointed out that with all this improvement, there will be a reduction in fuel consumption and a reduction in the carbon emission footprint on the environment, something uh, we are all cognizant of um, with development. And most importantly, there will be less stress to the people of the communities, more family time, more study time, less vehicle maintenance, and cost savings generally to the, the commuters. And it will also provide the opportunities for the small and medium enterprises to open up, uh, which would improve on an existing small and medium enterprise um, sector and to make business and trade more efficient as a whole. Um, so again, through you, Madam Speaker, I would, I would await um, further information as to the, the government's position um, on this project. Um, the other concern raised was uh, the completion of a hero's park in Faisabad, um, which I know has, has been started. Uh, Madam Speaker, as you know, Faisabad is a very historic town. The labor movement started Faisabad. Um, the name of Uriah Butler um, is associated with Faisabad. And of course, it's uh, very historic in terms of the oil industry and has provided tremendous resources um, for providing goods and services to other parts of this country. Um, so as I close, Madam Speaker, I would want to say that I have no doubt at all that all 41 members of this House have the country's best interests at heart. And it is refreshing to see so many young, bright, intelligent, and educated men and women uh, in this parliament. I can learn so much from them, and I look forward to learning a lot um, from them. Um, Madam Speaker, I just want to say that, again, to you, that we must at all times be cognizant of the fact that our deliberations in this House are carried live on television, radio, and the internet uh, via the Parliament channel, as well as to a live audience in the public gallery. Indeed, Madam Speaker, uh, you will recall that we had the privilege of school children uh, sitting in the public gallery here on Saturday morning, witnessing the way we conduct the business of the people. And to indicate, Madam Speaker, with the Commission, that we must never forget to lead by example and to debate with decorum. Um, Madam Speaker, it is not my intention to offend anyone, but I know we are all capable of so much more in this House. I thank you for the privilege. I, I call upon the Honourable Member for Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West. Madam Speaker, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, members of this House, it is with a great sense of humility and responsibility that I stand here to make my maiden speech in the lower house in this session and to contribute to the budget debate that is taking place. Firstly, Madam Speaker, allow me to congratulate you on your elevation to this position and your election to this position. I would then like to thank and congratulate the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago in doing what was right and is right for Trinidad and Tobago on the 7th of September and to particularly single out my constituents of Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West for their overwhelming support, Madam Speaker, as they broke the record in the election of me to office. If you would permit me, Madam Speaker, to just reflect very briefly on the period in getting into office and what I experienced. I was very fortunate, Madam Speaker, to be able to traverse and walk many areas in this great country of ours, of Trinidad and Tobago. I walked in areas such as Bangladesh in St. Joseph, Enterprise in Chagones. Areas of Laventil and Mova, East Port of Spain, Belmont, and other areas. And I bring this to your attention, Madam Speaker, to highlight some of what I experienced and saw on those journeys. I think it is critical to just lay this out here respectfully, Madam Speaker, because a mantra of my presentation shall be value for money. And it is important as we sit here passing this important budget 
and reflecting on what has gone past and the amounts and sums of money that you will hear me talk about being expended in very reckless and disturbing circumstances that we understand how it affects the lives of the simple citizens of our land. Whilst walking in some of these areas, Madam Speaker, I saw things that disturbed me. I use these experiences to propel me and to give me even more fire to move forward to do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. I saw the housing conditions and some of the lack and basic infrastructure the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago should have as the normal and daily course of their lives. But they have been deprived of, and we've just heard from the Honorable Attorney General a short while ago, a figure that I am certain will surpass a billion dollars once we've concluded our initial assessment and gotten all of the figures from the various ministries and state enterprises that are still outstanding. A billion dollars expended of taxpayers' money in a five-year period to a very small handful of people in a simple profession of attorneys at law. We have the best lawyers in the world. Madam Speaker, I have been fortunate to be practicing as an attorney in Trinidad and Tobago for the past 18 years. So it is with a sense of experience and a great sense of disappointment, I stand here today to report to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago as to the wanton abuse and what can only be described as an unholy assault on the treasury of Trinidad and Tobago by a profession that I was once proud to be associated with, that is attorneys at law. Madam Speaker, as I walk through my constituency and I saw some of the conditions that people live under, I became very angry knowing the type of money that had been recklessly wasted and expended by those on the other side in the last five years. The People's Partnership's abuse of the Treasury with things such as live sport and one individual getting in excess of $34 million having not given us, the citizens, as much as a shred of paper in return. This money, Madam Speaker, in my respectful view, could have been properly spent to improve the lives of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who are in need. $36 million, which we have become numb to now, would make a massive difference throughout my constituency to improve the lives of the constituents there. However, Madam Speaker, all is not lost. There's a community, Mackay lands and environs, who have fought hard times, and as a community, they have bound together, and they have gotten together to improve their own quality of lives, and there's not a give me, give me syndrome that they suffer with, and they've made me very proud, and like the rest of my constituency, I have promised to work along with them, hand in hand, to improve the quality of life. Madam Speaker, moving to this concept of value for money, it is a concept that we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, will return to and will be guided by, because it is our responsibility to ensure that we get value for money for taxpayers by the balancing of competing needs of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and balancing their needs along with the expenditure of the money that we are responsible for. Something, Madam Speaker, that I'm about to get into, that I respectfully submit, did not take place in the last five-year period. We have found ourselves in a climate of declining oil and gas revenues with increased expenditure by the former administration, and we, the newly elected government, must ensure that we get value for money. I'd just like to put the preparation and presentation of the budget in context, please, Madam Speaker. This government was overwhelmingly elected on the 7th of September. Our new Prime Minister was sworn in on the 9th of September. His full cabinet was sworn in on Friday the 11th of September. He summoned us to our first cabinet retreat on Saturday the 12th of September. And at this retreat, we began to receive numerous texts, phone calls and email about very disturbing circumstances taking place, Madam Speaker. We were being informed that even though a new government had been sworn in, 
you still had board members on state enterprises and persons in ministries trying to rush through, even though it was a weekend, and sign contracts committing the people of Trinidad and Tobago to further unreasonable expenditure. Another phenomenon taking place that weekend, Madam Speaker, that we were informed about was the shredding of documents in state ministries. As you heard the Attorney General say, in our ministry alone, there were over 100 bags of shredded documents removed in that first week of us being sworn into office. Cover up. We then had our first cabinet meeting, Madam Speaker, on Monday the 14th of September, and we reported to our ministries on Tuesday the 15th of September. And within three weeks, the Minister of Finance presented, produced, prepared, and presented a budget to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And for that, Madam Speaker, I respectfully submit, he should be applauded. Whilst this was taking place, Madam Speaker, we in our respectful ministries had to move quickly to get on top of things and to go through files and not only run our ministries now, and our Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs was a merged ministry, three now into one, but we also were having coming at us many, many allegations and stories of corruption that disturbed me and made my sleepless nights even worse. But in the first week, Madam Speaker, we met with the staff at the Ministry of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs. We met with the Chief Justice. We've met with the President of the Industrial Court, the Director of the Police Complaints As Association, and many other of our stakeholders. But what we found at our ministries was that morale was at an all-time low. So an immediate decision was taken by the Attorney General and myself. And we immediately told staff that what had become a custom and had become the norm would no longer be happening. We would no longer be retaining outside counsel at just the drop of a feather or the drop of a hat but rather we would build the resources. At the time, we thought it was only $400 million, $400 million spent on our ministry. We quickly assessed it and said that money could have spent on training, the improvement of terms and conditions for the staff at these ministries. The stories that our staff began to give us could not be described as anything less than distraught disturbing and sometimes unbelievable. Fortunately for us, they all provided us with documentary evidence and we have the documents to support what we, about, what we have spoken about and what I am about to speak about. Madam Speaker, before I move to the assault and the abuse of the Treasury via the use of payments of legal fees and provision of particulars in relation to what took place over the last five years, I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank the two PSs who have done yeoman service at the Ministry of Attorney General and Legal Affairs in the short time frame that we've been there. Madam Speaker, as this House and as the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have heard, what began to be on earth was a very disturbing trend. However, I cast our minds back into history. After the first budget presentation of the People's Partnership Administration in 2010, the then leader of the opposition and the now Prime Minister alerted the population to what was then seen and predicted as an uncanny, unusual, and disturbing rise in the amount of money provided to the Ministry of the Attorney General. He told us that he was concerned. He identified an issue. He went on to prosecute this issue. We had the then Attorney General telling us it was his A-team. Yeah. And he was putting into his A-team none other than his friends and close associates. He admitted that. He went on to commence legal action against the then leader of the opposition and now Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. However, we now have the documents in hand and we've seen without a shadow of a doubt, the abuse and the assault 
that took place over those last five years. Under the watch of Superior. I would like to provide, through you, Madam Speaker, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago with but a few examples of what took place in the last five years. We start with over $444 million being expended in five years towards legal fees from one ministry alone, the Ministry of the Attorney General, under the then leadership of the former Attorney General, Anan Ram Logan, and towards the end, Garvin Nicholas. The disturbing trend is that we found but a handful of names and individuals were those who benefited from this feeding froth and frenzy. We immediately requested of all ministries and state enterprises to provide us with the particulars, the totals of the fees requisitioned by individuals in the fraternity of law over this period of time. And again, we found in going through the information provided to us, a few names comprising the vast majority of these fees. Just a few examples. We unearthed within the first week of being in office that at the Ministry of Finance, directions were given with respect to two arbitrations that a firm of lawyers in London, United Kingdom, be retained by the Ministry of Finance, paid by the Ministry of Finance, over $1 million a month. Whoa. $1 million a month mm -hmm. over a period of time mm -hmm. for arbitration, for just instructing counsel in these arbitrations. Mm -hmm. Before we stopped it, the fee total was $18 million mm -hmm. to one firm of lawyers in the United Kingdom, paid by the Ministry of Finance. I repeat it, it Madam Speaker. $18 million paid to one firm of lawyers by the Ministry of Finance for two arbitrations that have gone nowhere. One that is completed and one that has not even commenced. There was also a number of matters pursued by the former administration, one of which was concluded just before the elections and in which I participated in, and that is a matter of UTT, the University of Trinidad and Tobago. It spectacularly com collapsed after two days of cross-examination, with it being found and the case being withdrawn because there was no evidence to support the allegations that were made. We estimate that this case alone would have cost taxpayers approximately 10 million dollars wow. in fees wow. and that 10 million dollars in fees madam speaker would not have been payment to the defendants lawyers but rather payment to the lawyers prosecuting the case one of the most disturbing aspects of that madam speaker was that it was admitted by the corporate secretary that the lawyers sent by the then attorney general Ann and ram logan are the ones who told the board that they would be pursuing the case, to pass the case over to them, and that it would be paid for by the Ministry of the Attorney General. And it was taken away from them. They were no longer brought up to date on what was happening with the case. In fact, they did not even see drafts of the statement of case and the proceedings before they were filed, Madam Speaker. Mm -hmm. We then had the termination of employment contract against CNMG yes. that my colleague, the Minister of Communication, is now in charge of. Yes. Over $600,000 expended for termination of employment. Madam Speaker, I have, throughout my career, done numerous industrial relations and termination of employment matters, and I have never heard of that level of fees, which would probably equate to more than the damages in such a matter. We had at the National Agricultural Marketing and Development Corporation $167,000 paid to one lawyer for an industrial court matter. Never happens. I don't even know the name of the lawyer. It's not even familiar to me. We then had one of these lawyers who is in the list that the Attorney General presented. A lawyer whose total cumulative amount that so far we've discovered is over $25 million in fees to this individual alone. 
charging $977,500, just short of a million dollars for a few matters and the provision of advice. $100,000 for habeas corpus application. $750,000 for representing two police officers. And $166,000 for the advice provided up to the filing of a defense in a matter. For an we then had the same law firm to which I've referred out of the United Kingdom, a favorite of the former Attorney General Anand Ram Logan, charging Petrotrin over $9 million for an arbitration. That same law firm that was charging a million dollars a month that accumulated to $18 million, charged Petrotrin $9 million for one arbitration. Two favored Queen's Counsel of the same former Attorney General were paid over $5 million for two arbitrations for Petrotrin and over $30 million, Madam Speaker, $30 million paid to a law firm for two arbitrations by Petrotrin. One of these arbitrations for Petrotrin, Madam Speaker, the lawyers, a foreign law firm, charged over 3.7 million US dollars, accumulating a fee of 23.5 million TT dollars. Madam Speaker, from what we have gathered to date and we expect to find more, the legal fees expended by Petrotrin for the period of five years totaled over 73 million dollars. I repeat, Madam Speaker, legal fees expended to a few and handful of lawyers by Petrotrin over the period of five years totaled over $73 million. We all know the state of Petrotrin and the difficulties that it is in, Madam Speaker. I then turn to the National Gas Company, a company that was highlighted by the media prior to the elections as being involved in some unusual circumstances. We have gotten a preliminary view of their fees. A foreign law firm was paid the exorbitant fee of over 4.8 million pounds for one matter. That is 48 million TT dollars paid for one, one matter, Madam Speaker. Another matter where once again all too familiar names and all too familiar favored individuals by that former Attorney General were paid over 7.5 million dollars for one matter, Madam Speaker. Criminal. And then one of the favored juniors took home from NGC for four equal opportunity commission matters, the sum of $1.2 million. There was a senior counsel, a local senior counsel, Madam Speaker, paid $12.3 million by NGC for one matter that did not go to trial, Madam Speaker. Oh. It did not go to trial. And the total legal fee at this preliminary stage for NGC over a five year period is $88.1 million, Madam Speaker. So if we add NGC and Petrotrin, two of the energy companies that are owned by the taxpayers and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, under the former regime, Madam Speaker, over a five-year period, for legal fees alone, they expended $162 million in a five-year period, Madam Speaker. Come Add that, Madam Speaker, to the $444 million expended by the Attorney General as a laugh on the other side, yeah, Madam Speaker. As Kamla's legacy without stocking. The sport company we found, sorry, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> the sport company of Trinidad and Tobago, we found that a favored junior for four advices, legal advices, charged over $600,000. At ETEC, at e we had pre-action protocol letters Pre-action protocol letters, the writing of letters, Madam Speaker, 
a favored senior counsel charging $86,250 for a pre-action protocol letter for one letter, $86,250. That same senior counsel charged $172,000 for an opinion. Madam Speaker, as we began to unearth this, and I threw my mind back to what I had seen in places like Enterprise and places like Bangladesh, and seeing how people in our country have lived, and knowing the expenditure between Petrotrin, NGC, and the Ministry of the Attorney General, just those three entities in a five-year period total $700 million, Madam Speaker. I take no pride in saying how sick I felt to my stomach. And to listen here in this house, Madam Speaker, over the last few days, at what I've heard from the other side, knowing what I do know now, and there's much more that we know, I think that this country and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago deserve to know how it is that one or two individuals decided over what I'm sure will total a billion dollars would be spent in one legal fraternity in Trinidad and Tobago. Another disturbing example was the retaining of an English QC who none of us knew of prior to his arrival on the shores of Trinidad and Tobago. And the due diligence done in relation and with respect to that English QC showed some very disturbing trends and a lack of respect at certain bars in the rest of the Caribbean. This English QC charged recently over 250,000 pounds for a Privy Council appeal on a procedural point in a matter that I have been involved in. 250,000 pounds for a procedural appeal at the Privy Council level, Madam Speaker. More disturbing is the fact that this QC has charged us, the taxpayers and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, over nine hundred thousand pounds close to 10 million TT dollars for an appeal at our tax appeal board that was settled nine hundred thousand pounds for a tax appeal at the tax appeal board of Trinidad and Tobago for a matter madam speaker that was settled a very interesting matter that came to my attention is a charge on us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, by one Jawala Rambaran. He sent two invoices, one in to the Ministry of the Attorney General, one in 2011 for $195,640, okay. and one in 2012 for $868,620 for the forensic management audit into the sale of BW London Heathrow slots to BE. One million dollars, one million sixty four thousand two hundred and sixty dollars charged to the taxpayers and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago by one Jawala Rambaran. What was even more upsetting about this, Madam Speaker, is the payment to Mr. Rambaran of eight hundred and sixty eight thousand six hundred and twenty dollars by the approval of the former Attorney General Anand Ram Logan was made on the fourth of July. 2012. This individual became the governor of the central bank on the 12th of July 2012. So eight days before he was put into that position, he was paid close to $900,000 for an advice that we still cannot find at the Ministry of the Attorney General. So he was paid over a million dollars by the Ministry of the Attorney General, by the former administration, a few days before he became the Governor of Central Bank for an advice that we still have not been able to find. He is not a lawyer. He was an economist, an analyst, I think, at the highest level. Another disturbing payment made by the Office of the Attorney General, $3.5 million to some company called Tiger Capital Limited. Two of these favored English Queen's, Queen's Council got from the Attorney General's office over the period of time, one $27.6 million, and he was not for the full five-year period, neither of them operated for the full five-year, the other 
$21.3 million, a total of approximately $50 million paid to two English Queen's Council. And we ask, what did they leave behind? Which local juniors, apart from the favored few, did they impart any knowledge to for $50 million? What is more disturbing, Madam Speaker, is these two English silk got collectively 108 million TT dollars from us, the taxpaying citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, in a five year period. Two individuals got 108 million dollars from us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And I will not tell you because I have appeared in court against both of them and I've never lost a case against either. Oh. One of the favored juniors, Madam Speaker, for the for charged ETEC over $750,000. And what is interesting about this is for him, he charged $200,000 to draft a claim form and a statement of case. That is a fee higher than I would charge from start to finish of a trial. $250,000 for an interlocutory application. $250,000 to take instructions, peruse documents, and draft an opinion. This same junior charges regularly over $200,000 for advice to the Office of the Attorney General. This individual has charged in one matter over $1 million in fees. That matter is none other than Section 34 <laughs> to deal with stiff Steve and Ish. A million dollars, us the taxpayers and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago paid to this favored junior who has less call to the bar than the Attorney General and myself. A million dollars for the Section 34 matter. Mm -hmm. The first part of it, he then charged 750000 for the appeal. He charged in the UTT matter for a pre-action protocol letter and a draft claim form and statement of claim, $300,000 for a letter and he lost the case, correct. And as I just said, he charged, and it is approved there by Ann and Ram Logan, $750,000 for the Section 34 appeal. He charged a million dollars for the matter of Petrotrin versus Malcolm Jones prior to one million dollars for the matter of Petrotrin versus Malcolm Jones prior to a statement of case being issued in the matter. So we, the taxpayers and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, paid this favored son a million dollars before he even stepped foot into court or completed the drafting of documents to commence an action. And it is all approved with the handwriting and signatures of a former Attorney General. This individual, Madam Speaker, on the 21st of October in the year 2013, was paid $3.2 million under the instructions of monies to be paid out on a number of invoices in one day. In one day, instructions were given by an Attorney General to pay this individual $3,282,000. This is the same lawyer who charged us $660,000 for a matter and did not even have the courtesy of turning up into court when the matter was called. He charged and was paid $660,000 for a matter against a former client of his so he's now appearing for the state against a former client of his, which may be the reason he didn't turn up in court, but he charged his state and was paid $660,000, Madam Speaker. This individual, this junior attorney, is also the subject of criminal investigation in Trinidad and Tobago. He's still retained and paid, even though they're ongoing criminal investigations, and to date, we have uncovered that he has been paid the sum of $26.5 million, $26 million to date. 
over a five-year period. A junior attorney being paid $26.5 million to date by those on the other side. And this individual is the subject of more than one police investigation. Madam Speaker, these are some of the startling and disturbing examples of what can only be considered a premeditated assault on the Treasury by a small handful of attorneys. And to date, 10 of them have been paid over $245 million by us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And where is the value for money with their cases collapsing after two days of cross-examination? Madam Speaker, these disturbing facts have attracted the attention of the Attorney General and I. And we tell the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago that we are disturbed by it and we will be deciding what can be done in relation to it. Another part of what I'm called upon to do today, Madam Speaker, is talk about this government's legislative agenda. So I move from the disturbing assault and abuse of the Treasury that I'm sure the citizenry of Trinidad and Tobago, as we are in this house, are disturbed and numb by after giving them the assurance that it has not escaped our eye and we are prepared to take unprecedented action in relation to sale. Madam Speaker, during our tenure, we intend to bring to Parliament legislation to achieve some of the following. Local government reform, the Prime Minister has appointed an interministerial committee that is chaired by the Honourable Franklin Khan, co-chaired by myself, to bring legislation after a consultation process to the Parliament prior to the next constitutionally dated local government election, which would be at the end of next year. We are already working on whistleblowing legislation. The Revenue Authority, I am working feverishly and assiduously on. Campaign finance reform, we intend to kick off in Trinidad and Tobago in January of next year by having a conference where we will invite international speakers and those who already have this type of legislation in their jurisdictions to present and get us on the path to campaign reform financing. We will have an independent statistics office to, to, to bolster what the work the CSO should have been doing. We will introduce a code of conduct for the members of parliament. We are looking at amendments that can be brought with respect to the Integrity and Public Life Act. The Trinidad and Tobago International Financial Center is attracting our attention. The General Accounting Office is an independent office of Parliament. But some of the legislative matters that we will be bringing to the House, Madam Speaker. The two areas of concern I've been asked to highlight that we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, have inherited. Much to our... Much to our... our chagrin, we found ourselves about to be downgraded in two international areas that we would like to alert the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to. The first is FATF, and we are working assiduously with respect to what has happened. There's been a fall through of legislation, the regulators are not being properly manned, and the law enforcement don't have <coughs> sufficient resources. So there's a possibility that we will be downgraded with respect to FATF. What we are working on, on, on amending and, and ensuring that no downgrade takes place. We are working with the authorities as we go into a fourth round assessment. Another disturbing area and trend that we inherited is with respect to traffic, trafficking in persons. We are about to be downgraded, or there's a possibility, Madam Speaker, of us being downgraded from tier two to tier two watch list. However, the Attorney General and myself are working with the authorities and trying to get sufficient resources in to ensure that there's prosecution and also other areas, including we're looking at a border protection agency, which is a multi-task force of the various law enforcement agencies in Trinidad and Tobago. The point being, Madam Speaker, that we want the international world to know 
but we are aware of these issues and we're working assiduously and expeditiously to alleviate their concerns. Mm -hmm. Great. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that we are going to be working on the reform of the criminal justice system. We have met already with the Chief Justice and other areas within the criminal justice system that we need to. Two projects that we believe that will immediately have positive effects on the system, Madam Speaker, that were alluded to in the budget presentation, are video conferencing facility at Remand Yard, which we expect, once implemented, would completely remove the need for the bringing of prisoners to and from the magistrate's court unnecessarily. And then also, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, we're going to be working with the judiciary to see if we can launch a pilot project for the use of lay magistrates for traffic matters and other petty, and petty civil court matters. We are also committed, as you've heard, Madam Speaker, to granting the judiciary fin financial autonomy, something they've been clamoring for for years. Madam Speaker, if you would allow me to talk very briefly about the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs. Madam Speaker, what has taken place is the merging of the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs as well as certain parts of the Ministry of Justice into one. And the Honorable Prime Minister had the foresight to appoint two cabinet members to do the work of these ministries, the Attorney General and myself. What we are committed to doing is re-establishing the morale, the support of the staff of these ministries and getting it back to the way it used to be. Whereas he alluded, the Attorney General alluded to, the members of staff in these offices would be the first port of call in defending the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago against claims brought against the state of Trinidad and Tobago. We intend to work with great resources, the human resources that exist in these ministries, those that have not been run out, and also to attract new, res new resources to these ministries. We're going to be offering training that they've been asking for, and then we've also told them that in the few occasions where the matters may require expert opinion, advice, and the expertise of silk. We expect our juniors in these ministries to work underneath the silk, to learn like sponges. And we've challenged them, Madam Speaker, that on the next occasion, any such matter comes up, they must lead the mantle and the charge. Already, Madam Speaker, we're seeing positive results and the morale in these ministries is being lifted and boosted yes, sir. by something as simple as the Attorney General and myself going down to each floor of each department and meeting with the staff on their own floors and in their own space. We've been told by some of the staff that this is something that did not take place over the last five years. Checks will have written the yes. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we have met with the President, Vice President and Secretary of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago. And we've told them that with respect to what we've seen in terms of the assault and the abuse of the Treasury with respect to legal fees over the last five years, that is not going to continue under us. We are going to consult with the fraternity and we've told them that what we intend to do is use a fee schedule that is a fee schedule decided by the judges. And then we're going to be asking for discounts on that fee schedule. We believe that the taxpayers in a value for money system should be given discounts by lawyers as part of their contribution to Trinidad and Tobago. Should we find out of any lawyers being retained to do work and them not working? We are also looking at the use of the disciplinary committee provisions of the law, the Legal Profession Act to deal with such lawyers. Immediately what we have begun to do and what we have achieved is we have cut some of the sizes of the legal teams we found that were retained on behalf of the state. For example, in the Jack Warner extradition matter, we've immediately cut the sizes of these legal teams, thereby immediately see 
immediately saving for the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago millions of dollars. This has gone on across the board. And if you would now permit me, Madam Speaker, to turn to my constituency. Very good, very good representative. Madam Speaker, in the period of 11 months prior to the election, I walked the length and breadth of my constituency and met with as many of the constituents as I could have. I have seen on more than one occasion, on some occasions, four times. I saw the problems and the issues in these constituencies. I made no promises apart from the promise to do my best. But I was determined and told them, and they are committed to working hand in hand with me, Madam Speaker, to improve the quality of life for the constituents of Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West, over the next five years. Immediately, what will be happening is just a couple highlighted ex examples in the constituency in the next year. There will be the construction of the Belmont Boys RC. We will also be working to fix some of the eyesores in the constituency. For example, the repair of the president's house. It is long overdue, and we're hoping to get it done. <laughs> Madam Speaker, homework centers. I have already put in train and have formed committees to help me to get homework centers up and running for the younger constituents. It is my dream and my vision to ensure that they have the same opportunities my children do. They must come from school. They must get warm meals, Madam Speaker. They must then have persons who can supervise their homework. And after that, they must have exposure to extracurricular activities such as football, cricket, hopefully swimming, scouting, and other areas. We are going to look after the younger children in the constituency. With respect, Madam Speaker, to the young adults in the constituency, who had long hearts and looks of this own, and no hope. I am committed to developing workshops in the constituency to assist them with sustainable jobs and for us to move away as much as possible from the CPEP and the URP programs to provide them with training that would assist them with sustainable development and hopefully sustainable jobs. We have already begun to source the equipment and the spaces necessary to make this a reality. And as my friends in Lab, my colleagues in Lavantil East, Lavantil West did over the weekend, the bringing of UTT, COSAT, and all of the opportunities training and training agencies to the young people in the constituency, as they have led the charge with. We are also looking to the redevelopment and re-establishment of community centers in the constituency, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am one who is usually very conservative with my use of words. And it is with these few words, I thank you sincerely, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and the members of this house for the opportunity to have made my maiden presentation in the lower house. Fantastic. And I look forward to working on that. Honourable Members, it is 12.22. I want to propose that we take the lunch break now. I therefore... This house, therefore, is suspended and shall resume at 12.25. No, no, no. 1.25. I am sorry, 1.25. 1.25 p.m.